Well, since there was no catechism, that means I get to preach longer, right? John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse 16. Brother David already read the whole chapter, so we'll just read a few verses, including all of our text for today. John 3, begin reading in verse 16. Let's hear the word of the Lord. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, the light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil." For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Let's go before him in prayer. Our Father, what a privilege it is to be in your house today, to be filled with your spirit, and stirred up to worship your Son. We are grateful for His atoning death, whereby we may be uh, declared not guilty before you, that we may be not condemned in your sight. We pray that you would teach us from your word this afternoon, that you would remove all hindrances and obstacles to hearing and understanding your word, that you would Uh, Forgive us of our sins, that you would uh, destroy our flesh that would seek to hinder us in our walk with you and in our love for you. We pray that you would come, O Spirit, now, illumine us and quicken us, for we have learned even in this very text that our flesh cannot help us, Lord, and if the Spirit does not teach us, if we are not revealed these things from above, we cannot know them, we cannot Uh, comprehend them we cannot walk in the light of them and so we pray that you would come and teach us O lord to glorify yourselves as you work in us that you alone might be praised amen last time together of course we considered um, perhaps the most well-known bible verse the well most well-known synopsis of the gospel john 3 16 of course the teaching that the world hated God, this world that He has made. Uh, We hated God and made His world unlovely, and yet He loved His rebellious, tarnished world, and into it sent the sinless Son of God that it would be redeemed. That Son that now speaks to Nicodemus, testifying to the eternal truth that He knows. While mankind has been the destruction and the defilement of the world. Jesus Christ is the glory and splendor of heaven come down to testify to man the things that he knows, the things that he is, um, things that he as the sole ambassador from heaven can declare to lost men such as Nicodemus. And what did Nicodemus need to know? He needed to know that all of his toiling was not going to make himself right with God. That was the, the very uh, core of the Pharisaical religion, that our adherence to the law and our devotion to all the minutia of the Pharisees is going to make us right with God. And Jesus has just told him that mankind is not saved by any effort of the flesh. There, it's not even, their salvation is not even complemented by any effort of the flesh. It's all a work of God from beginning to end. And that in verse 16, faith is what God wants. Whosoever believes in Him, all the ones believing in Him in the Greek. Faith is what God wants, not your efforts. Faith is what God requires of you to be born again and to enter into eternal life. It's not your efforts. They don't accrue any kind of um, merit before God. Only 
the blood of Jesus, the one who was given by God. And all who believe in the Son, Jesus Christ, have the eternal life that he merited, accredited to them. And the perishing, the condemnation that was their lot has been borne by Jesus and the punishment thereof has been absolved by the work of Jesus. So why did Jesus come to earth? To condemn the world? No. But that the world might be saved. The world, not just the Jews, not just the children of Israel, the seed of Abraham, but that the whole world might be saved, including the Gentile nations that for thousands of years have lain in darkness, have lain in darkness, rather. And so it's not trusting in their earthly lineage that they were children of Abraham that was going to uh, save them. It's not their toiling, according, even according to the law of God, that's going to save them. But the ones that are saved are all the ones believing in the Son. Those are the ones that have eternal life, who by faith trust in the sufficiency of Christ's work plus none of their own. And so Jesus is going to, Lord willing, we're going to work through these verses uh, that conclude Jesus' uh, interview with Nicodemus. We don't hear anything more from the lips of Nicodemus. Verse 21 is uh, going to conclude Jesus' teaching to Nicodemus. And in his final recorded dialogue, let's pick up in verse 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. First, let's clear up any perhaps misunderstanding here. Again, no more than in verse 16, this passage does not teach a universal salvation, which is called universalism. The idea that all souls will be saved in the end. Some may have to go through a purgatorial time uh, in order to be cleansed, in order to make the uh, heavenly kingdom, but all souls are saved in the end. The condition of faith unto salvation makes no sense at all if all will ultimately be saved. There's no uh, expediency to the gospel. There's why this condition, we're all going to make it in the end. Quite the contrary, in John, one of John's other books, Revelation 21, 8, as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. There's that perishing that John 3.16 is talking about. But if God had sent Jesus purely according to justice and not love, John 3.16 might have read something like this. For God was so angry at the world that He sent His only begotten Son that all should perish in eternal death. But in love, God sent His Son. And God very well could have judged the world with total condemnation. He did it once in Noah's day. And mankind, they, they, those who are apart from God, walk around expecting the condemnation of God to fall on them. Uh, but God made a covenant with Noah. He made a covenant with Moses and with Abraham. And with David, and we have a whole history of grace that brings us to John 3, 17. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. This term condemn comes from the Greek krino, which is uh, to select or to choose. Um, and John uses it a number of times, he uses it, it's used 114 times in the, the New Testament. John uses it 14 times in his gospel, and he uses it nine times in Revelation as well. It's interesting in John's gospel how judge, this is the first mention of it right here of this term in John 3, 17. But it's interesting how in John's gospel, the judgment is said to belong to the Son in multiple places. Just a page or two over, John 5.22. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And there Judge John 18, I'm sorry, John 8, verses 16 and 26 kind of reflects that thought. 
And then the last mention of this term in John's writings, indeed the last mention of this term in all of Scripture, is in Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13, of this judging, this condemnation of which John speaks here. Revelation 20, in verse 12, John speaks in the first person and he says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged, there's our term, by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, there's the term again, the last use of it. Each one of them according to what they had done. So this condemnation is not merely a temporal punishment that John has in view here. There is either those who are believing, who go on to eternal life, or there are those who do not believe, and they go on to eternal condemnation, to eternal damnation. Guilt is universal. All men are made in the image of God and they know that God exists. Like Pastor Little, again, he's, he's always working with me even though we, we don't correspond about our text this morning. Even the children know that God exists and they carry guilt. They know when they've done wrong. They have the law of God written on their heart too. Romans 1 again testifies to this. Men know that God is not like them. That God is light and they are darkness. God is holy and they are unholy. God is righteous and they are sinful and wicked. And if God should send an ambassador from heaven to earth, why else would it be but to rain down condemnation on all the inhabitants of the earth? While the Pharisees did indeed have guilt, they believed that perhaps by their religious zeal, they would have no condemnation to fear. How do we know this? Well, Nicodemus' shock at being told that he must be born again is evidence of that belief, that they thought by their zeal they were, they were making amends for their sin, for their wrongdoing. And the Jews, in another sense, they were hoping for an ambassador from heaven. They were hoping for their promised Messiah who was supposed to come and free them from the bondage of the Roman Empire and bring a condemnation on all who were not the physical lineage of Abraham. But that is not why God sent His Son into the world. He did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Why? But in order that the world might be saved through Him. Because God's mercy is infinitely greater than man's. In love, God sent His only begotten Son to be the object of saving faith, not of divine wrath for the world, including Israel and all surrounding nations. The only ones that need to fear the condemnation are those who will not believe. Jesus is testifying to Nicodemus that He has not come to bring condemnation to others, but that He has come to take condemnation upon Himself. In verse 18, John 3, Whoever believes in Him, in the Son, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And those are the two words that every human wants to hear from their Maker that they know exists. Not condemned. Because that's their great problem. That's, that's their, their crisis that they walk around condemned. And for those in Christ Jesus, this is a blessed reality now. Like Pastor Little said during communion, we're not partially saved now and we'll be fully saved when we enter heaven. We're fully saved if you've believed in Jesus now. You are fully saved now. Your guilt is cleansed now. If you have been forgiven of your sins, you've believed in the gospel and the Holy Spirit has indwelt you, bears witness to your spirit, you are a child of God, you are a fully saved fully a child of God, now. Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The hymn writer says about those souls in heaven, they're more happy, but they're not more secure than the souls of the saints on earth. They're more happy because they comprehend more of Christ. 
the great delight of our souls. But they're no more secure than any of God's precious ones on this earth. They, none of them will be lost either. They will all make their heavenly home and they are just as much a son and daughter now as they will be a thousand years into their heavenly existence. But for those who reject the gospel, as long as you reject the gospel, you are under the wrath of God. There is no neutral state between believing and unbelieving. Well, I'm not under His wrath yet because I still might believe in the future. Oh no, you're under His wrath now if you're not believing. Don't entertain these thoughts of, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of waffling between the two. Oh no, you're under His wrath now if you're not believing in the gospel. Do not kid yourself. Do not toy with God. You are under His wrath if you do not believe the gospel. There's no virtue whatsoever in a kind of agnosticism that says, well, I don't know if I believe or not. Maybe I did, but I wasn't sincere. I'm not sure. Well, if you're not sure, then go ahead and believe. You know, quit wasting time thinking about the past and whether I, there was a day back then I believe. Believe today. Today's the day of salvation. How long will you halt between two opinions? Serve the Lord. Believe in Him. Take Him at His word. Don't waste any time. Well, I'm not sure if I believe. Well, get sure because eternity is coming and Jesus is going to return. So get sure. You can know for certain that you are under the wrath of God if you have not believed in His Son for salvation. And when you hear that Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, do not take that to mean you'll get clean away from any kind of retribution from God. Well, if He didn't send it to condemn, then I, I must be okay. Oh no, don't, don't buy into universalism. There is a condemnation, and it is for those who will not and willfully refuse to believe the gospel. You should fear the condemnation of God if you have not believed, because it is for those who will not believe. And do not presume that you are free from condemnation if you will not believe, because the condemnation is reserved for those people who say, well, I, I will not believe. I, I, I've heard the gospel. I don't, I don't like it. They mock it, but they will not believe. Then the condemnation of God is upon you now. And so, what must you get to doing? Believe. Again, we must be born again, but we also must believe the gospel. We don't want to minimize or exaggerate either one of those. You must be born again. Without it, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You must believe. Without that, you will not have eternal life. You will not enter heaven. And so as lesson we've been learning in John 3 is, of course, good works will not save you. Religious devotion will not save you. Heritage and bloodlines will not save you. You must be born again. You must believe in the name of the only Son of God. And, and it, is, it is interesting today, very interesting, that the one thing which can and will and has delivered souls from the guilt and condemnation of God is the one thing other souls won't do. They will pursue anything else. They will Something as simple as believing, and they will go and devote their life to anything but that. They'll go lock themselves up in a monastery. They'll go do all these kind of good works and humanitarian efforts and all the while forsake believing. God has not asked you to do any of those other things. He's told you to believe. He's commanded you to repent and believe His gospel. And that, that's the one thing that sinners continually resist doing. They will devote their lives in all kinds of other things for various motives. But the one thing they will not do is come and believe the gospel. Why? Because it takes the work of God. But you're still commanded to do it. Still commanded to believe. And it's through the, the, the preaching of the gospel that sinners are made to uh, be born again and to believe in God. Nothing could be easier than believing. And sinners want something hard to do instead. They want to prove themselves to God. Just like Naaman, when he was told to go do something as simple as washing a river seven times. And what do you do? He should have been racing to the river to go get clean. And he's sitting here complaining to his soldiers like, man, I wish I got something harder to ask. And, so, and they're, they're thinking, man, you're over here dying from leprosy and you're complaining about the remedy you got that was super easy? Not like you had to go through any rigorous surgery or anything. We're talking about going and washing a river. And so he listened to his soldiers and, and went. We're talking about something as simple as having faith in God. And yet men steal their hearts up against that and resist God. Nothing could be easier than believing. And yet sinners go about doing all sorts of hard things. 
in an effort to appease God, to impress God, to show that they are devoted to Him in some way. But if you will not believe, God has made it clear that condemnation is all you can expect. Because believing doesn't give any glory to men. And that's really what men who devote themselves to all kinds of humanitarian efforts and asceticism and all these things, they want people to be impressed with that. God, we heard it this morning in the sermon, God's no respecter of persons. He doesn't need, he doesn't need to see your uh, devotion. He doesn't need your good works. He doesn't need your humanitarian efforts. He needs you to trust Him. He's commanded you to repent and believe in Him. So he, he gets all the glory. Jesus is the only way to God. There's no one being saved except by His blood. This is the only condition here, is to believe. There's no, not a list of things. There's just one. Believe in the name of the Son. Jesus is, the, is not one way among many. He is the only way to be saved. The way, the truth, the life. You must believe in Him. The only condition in the text. God is not a pluralist. There's not multiple sons for different religions. It's not that, well, the Jews have, um, the Jews have Jesus and uh, Muslims have somebody else and we have Isaac, we have Ishmael and all these things. It's, there's one son and, it, and the one condition is believing in his name so that God gets all the glory so that you have access to the perfect righteousness of Christ through faith. Justification through faith in Jesus' name. To not believe in the Son is to choose condemnation for yourself. For the wrath of God is quickly kindled. But for those who believe, who have kissed the Son, they are blessed for taking refuge in Him. And so as long as you do not believe, you carry privately the verdict that will one day be publicly broadcasted before everyone who ever lived on the earth, condemned eternally. And you are condemned already, as the text says, because your verdict is clearly known to you. As long as you live and breathe and have not believed the gospel, you are a condemned man or woman. The, thus the urgency to repent and to believe and to find Christ, seek Him while He may be found. Today's the day of salvation. Poole had a good uh, illustration of, on condemned already. He said it's like a man with a mortal wound on the field of battle. He's not dead yet, but the wound is mortal, and he's very soon going to die. If you have not believed in the gospel, you have a mortal wound. You are right now not dead yet. You've not entered into that eternal punishment and condemnation, but it is coming. It is coming. Therefore, repent and believe. What are you waiting for? And what is the reason given for this condemnation? What, what is the reason? We've talked before in John 3 about how you must be born again. The divine, sovereign work of God in regeneration. You must be born again. So perhaps the reason for the condemnation of a sinner is that God chose not to give them second birth. Perhaps, that God chose not to elect them unto salvation. Is that the reason that the Scripture gives? For this, what is the reason the Scripture gives for your condemnation? Oh, it puts it all on you, the responsibility. Because He has not believed. There's the reason for the condemnation. It's not any fault of God's that you are lost and eternally uh, condemned. Your condemnation is your own choosing because you chose not to believe. Your condemnation is not God's fault. Your condemnation is your fault. And... As God says in Ezekiel 33, 11, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Why have you chosen death, is what the Lord is saying. Why will you die? God is not willing to, uh, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, not willing that any should perish. So forsake every other hope for eternal life and believe. Forsake Phariseeism. Forsake trusting anything you've done. It's because of what you've done that you need to trust in Jesus. Verses 19 and 20. 
And this is the judgment, the crisis in the Greek, based on the noun verb. I'm sorry, noun verb, that doesn't make any sense. The noun version of the verb condemned in verses 18 and 17. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. Throughout the Scriptures, but especially in the New Testament, light is equated with godliness and holiness and darkness is equated with sinfulness and wickedness. This is popular uh, contrast that's made. Uh, there is one in the Old Testament. There's probably more, but there's one I know of. Proverbs 4, Proverbs 4, 18 and 19. We see a contrast made there between light and darkness. But the path of the righteous, this is Proverbs 4, 18, is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness, they do not know over what they stumble. And then in the New Testament, there's a multitude of contrasts here, including the one in John 3. If you look at John 8, verse 12, we see it again. John 8, 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then Acts, Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Acts 26, verse 18. We'll begin reading in... Um, oh, verse 18 is fine. To open their eyes, speaking of the Gentiles there, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And then 2 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 and 15, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? There's one contrast. What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? In that, that sequence of four contrasts, we have light with darkness. Again, Christ and Satan, believing and unbelieving. And then Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 7. We see it again here. Paul makes use of it several times. Ephesians 5, verse 7. Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. And then once more from the pen of Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 and 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 and 5. He writes, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. And then Peter also makes use of this contrast. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Brother Wes was in this verse a couple of Wednesday nights ago, I believe. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And then one final one. I told you there was a number of them. Uh, John again in 1 John. 
chapter 5, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 5, 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin." So there's a number of, of contrasts between light and darkness. This is a contrast even perverted Hollywood acknowledges today. The good guy is typically wearing white, bad guy typically wearing black. It's universally uh, recognized. And so some things we could gather from the, those texts. Spiritually, light is salvation. Light is God-like. Naturally, light reveals things such as beauty and truth. Christians are not ashamed of who they are and what they do. They don't try to conceal their light under a bushel. They confess their sins one to another and do not look for a dark place to hide them. They do righteous deeds as they live by the law of God and do not have a reason to be ashamed of the light exposing what they do because they are following the law of God while they live in His world. Spiritually, though, darkness is death and evil. Naturally, of course, darkness conceals and hides. Um, I've, in the past, at times, I, I've, en- I've enjoyed watching uh, cop shows and those, those 48-hour mystery shows and stuff. It's amazing the proportion of crimes that are committed in the night versus in the day. Many, many, many crimes committed in the night because... Um, more eyes are, are uh, or less eyes are on what you're doing. There's more coverage. And anyone who dares to sin against God and man, it's easier to do it in the dark. There's a preference to do it in the dark because they know if their deed was brought to light that it would be seen as the horrible crime against God and humanity that it is. And they don't want to be convicted of their sins. They don't want to have their wicked deeds exposed to their humiliation, the latter part of verse 20. They don't come to the light lest they be exposed. They fear exposure upon what they do. This is the judgment, the crisis of man, that the darkness of fallen mankind is so great that they would rather live under a lie of irrationality, live a, than submit to the revealed truth of God. They would rather do what they want to do and plunge themselves into sin and wickedness than turn and believe in Jesus. And so great is their unbelief that they would rather deny the witness of all creation that testifies to the eternal power and divine nature of God than believe He exists and loves the world enough to send His only begotten Son. So the problem is not with God's condemnation. The problem is that mankind loves their sins. They would rather have their sins than have God. And the problem isn't that God hasn't revealed enough or that what He has revealed isn't clear enough somehow. The problem is that sinners love their sin and the darkness that keeps their folly and wickedness from being exposed for what it is. But God is uh, not mocked. Night is as day to Him. He sees all things done in secret. And all those secret things will be brought into judgment. I like this quote from Jeff Johnson, pastor friend of mine in uh, Conway, Arkansas, from his book, Absurdity of Unbelief. Fantastic book. Uh, Apologetic resource. Quote from that book, If God is exiled, it is man who will go into captivity. If we cast out the warmth of the light, cold and dreary darkness is bound to consume us. If we have sought to be enlightened without looking at the light, it is no wonder that all we discover is dark. If we throw away God's law, let us not be surprised if we cannot find our way. Doesn't that sound like society? If we do not want to gaze on heavenly things, let us not be shocked if hell is all we see. And so when mankind rejects the true light that John spoke of in verse 9 of his 
chapter 1 of his gospel, the true light which is coming into the world. When mankind rejects the true light of Christ, there's only stumbling and darkness left. There's only rampant wickedness left. What remains, according to Cornelius Van Til, is empty words of mental darkness, self-congratulatory foolishness, and vain and pointless philosophy. Nothing of any profit whatsoever. Mankind on his best day. And it seems to be having its day in our day. Uh, Van Til, of course, passed away in 87. What would, what would he say? How much harsher could he put it if he could see the, the world we're in today? Uh, Ephesians 4, we think of mankind being in darkness. That's not the worst of men. That's the best of men apart from God. We're in darkness. Ephesians 4. We tend to think, well, yeah, the, the worst of men, those are the ones that are really dark. No, the best of men on their best of days are all together in darkness. Ephesians 4, verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of what? Is it some problem with God? No, because of the ignorance that is in them. Why is that? Is that ignorance God's problem? No, due to their hardness of heart. That's, that is the description of the best of men on their best of days apart from God. Altogether dark, alienated from God, ignorant and hard-hearted. And if God is not in it, then it is darkness. The best of men, that's all we have. If God does not uh, visit us, if God does not give us second birth, that is all we have. On our, on our best day, we walk around in the futility of our minds, and we see it in, in every area that God, where God is not, where the true light is cast out. We see it in government. We see it in intellectualism, philosophy, psychology, education, community, religion, entertainment, business. You, can, you name it. Where the true light is cast out, darkness is all that is left. If God is not in it, then it is darkness. And if you seek meaning... In life, apart from God, you are only plunging yourself into darkness. There are no secrets out in the dark. There's just dark. There is no getting found in the dark. You can't, unless, unless you cry out to God to save you. That is your only hope if you plunge yourself into the dark. God is the only one that can return you back. So, John says... People loved the darkness rather than the light. Why? Because the darkness keeps them from being exposed. And then there's another contrast here. Verse 21. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Does what is true. I like that phrase. Does what is true. Why? Because the Christian faith is not just a compendium of principles to be believed. It's a lifestyle to be lived. And how do we know what that lifestyle looks like? Well, we have four Gospels on the life of Jesus to tell us. One would have been sufficient. We have four. And that's the manner of life we are to follow. The example of Christ, the true light that we walk in. We are to do what is true. James, we went through James together last time. Uh, be doers of the Word and not hearers only. We don't just gather here just to, just to hear things and then go out and live however we want. We come to God's house to be directed, fed from His Word, so that we know how to go live the other six days. And we're out in the world doing our business, living with our families. Whoever does what is true comes to... The light, the Christian faith is not just mental assent to creeds and doctrines. It's not just memorizing things. It's fine to know the catechism, but do you live it? Do you love it? It's a truth to be obeyed. And this person that comes to the light, they don't come to the life for a kind of self-promotion. They come to the light 
so that it may be clearly seen that His works have been carried out in God. They don't fear the light because it's God that works in them. The carried out in God is the way the ESV chooses to translate that perfect passive participle. That those who do what is true have no reason to fear the light and every reason to come to the light. The believer does not fear the light because he's not ashamed of what he does. Why is he not ashamed? Because it's God that's told him what to do and it's God that has enabled him to do it. And when it is seen, it is God that gets the glory for it. So he doesn't fear the light. And he doesn't run into the light for self-promotion either. It's not pride because the light only reveals that it was the Holy Spirit filling him that made him do anything good and pleasing to God. Those who are proud run to the dark. But those who are doing what is true, who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, they want what they do to be manifest because it's unto the glory of God. We don't do what we do in a corner. We don't keep a light under a bushel, but let it shine. And that it's God that works in us to will and to do His own pleasure for His own glory. The whole reason why we exist. We cannot, of course, be born again apart from a work of God. And we can't even do any good works unless God works in us and by us. Because that's the only way good works are carried out, by God working in us. And so people who, who, who labor and toil their whole lives, well, I think I've got a list down of the good works God wants me to do, and now I'm going to go do it. Well, even if you got down to just the commandments, the Ten Commandments, and kept those, you're still keeping them from the wrong motive. You're keeping them because you want God to be impressed with you, not because you are believing in the work of Christ to atone for your wretched work and you are wanting to keep them out of a grateful heart of love and obedience unto God. So we can keep the law for the wrong motive, of course. And the unbeliever, tragically, is so blind that he sees the darkness as safety and drives into it. But the love of the believer drives them to the light so that what God is doing in them is manifested for His glory. So Nicodemus came to the light, the true light of the world, under a twofold cover of darkness. He came to Him by night because he didn't want other people, he didn't want the uh, reporters to get out that the teacher in Israel, a member of the Sanhedrin, was conversing with this uh, the this, this same one that had thrown out the animals and the money changers out of the temple just before. So Nicodemus comes under a twofold cover of darkness, under natural darkness and under spiritual darkness. And he has gotten a lesson. He said, we know you are come from God. Rabbi, you are a teacher, come from God. And he has been taught through now these uh, 21 verses that make up the dialogue. We, like Nicodemus, are under darkness that covers our hearts, minds, will, and emotions. Except God give us second birth. Because we, no less than Nicodemus, need the true light of the world to break into our darkness, to give us second birth. Mankind is in darkness no, by no fault of God. God has not compelled us to sin. But because we have shut our eyes as tightly as possible to keep from seeing any light. But praise God, His light gets through any filters, even our tightly shut eyelids, <coughs> spiritually speaking. God will get all the glory if you are saved, because it's God who must give you second birth. And all any good works that you do are carried out in God, because it is God that works in us to will and to do for His good pleasure. If you are saved and if you do good works, it is all glory to God. All glory to God. But if you are lost, if you are condemned, if you are damned, it is your own crisis, your own decision, your own choosing, because you have willfully rejected God's Son. You have turned from the true light into darkness. And so at His first coming, Jesus was sent to teach, as He has Nicodemus, to sow the seeds of the gospel, a work that He has commissioned His church, His bride, to continue 
until he returns again. And he came at the first time not to give condemnation, but to take condemnation upon himself. But at his second coming, however, Jesus will come as the harvester to justly judge and condemn the world and all who have not believed. By world, condemn the world, I mean all who have not believed in his name and all who failed to believe in him for salvation and eternal life. So what a word to leave with Nicodemus. There it is, Nicodemus. You must be born again. You must believe in the Son. And so that is what I leave with you as we close this dialogue. You must be born again. There is no eternal life apart from that. There is no right standing with God. You must believe. You must believe the gospel. There is no right standing with God apart from that. There is no eternal life. You must believe. You must be born again. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are grateful that you do warn us of the wrath to come. And we are grateful that you have made a way whereby we can be spared the wrath to come in your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we take refuge this day. If there are some, Lord, who are unsure of whether they believe or not, we pray that you would remove whatever obstacle it is. Lord, open their eyes to see the light. Draw them to yourself, I pray. Lord, keep us from trusting in anything but Christ to uh, gain favor with you. You are pleased with but one, your Son, and all whom he mediates for. So Lord, let us be found in him. Let us be uh, covered, washed in his blood, uh, regenerated by your Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that you would fill us with that Spirit, that we might do good works unto the glory of of your name, that we would live uh, as though we belong to you and that you have the right to tell us what to do, for that is altogether true. And so we pray that our lives, by obedience to you, by your Spirit working in us, would bring honor and glory to you, that we may say our time on this earth was not in vain. pray these things in your name. Amen. Our brother Josiah is going to come lead us in a closing hymn together.